Thank you uh, to the conference organizers for inviting me and for the yummy ice creams. <laughs> I was going to give a talk on HIV prevention and social protection, but over the last two days, I've realized that there is a part of prevention that is far more important and I think far more interesting and urgent for this group. And that is the part of prevention which is about adherence to ART. And particularly for us, adherence to ART amongst children and adolescents. I've heard as the, as the meeting has gone on, um, talk after talk where we've hit this, this question mark, this puzzle, this challenge of however, however well we develop our regimens, however well and clearly we specify when we deliver them and when we start them and when we change them. What we're struggling with is what goes on when children and teenagers leave the clinic or the hospital and go home and have to take those things every damn day. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to think about what do we know about adherence, what do we know about what's causing non-adherence, and what might we be starting to understand. And I think there's some great and exciting new work in how we can improve adherence for these teens and children. And it's going to mean thinking quite outside the clinic. So a huge thank you to our funders. We write a lot of funder reports. I'm mainly going to talk about um, our research and, and, and others as well, but, but our research comes from two studies, um, both ongoing. One of them is called Mzansi Wako, which means our ah, South Africa, if you're being polite, or our ah, down south, if you're not. Um, and this is a, a three-year cohort of 1,000 HIV-positive adolescents um, and 500 of their, of their uninfected neighbors and friends. And, um, Dr. Ilona Tosca and Roxana Hagiata um, sitting along the row over there and um, have been absolute um, key drivers of this study. Please ask them any difficult stats questions. And it's essentially, the, the idea of this study was to try and understand what teenagers' lives are like taking ART in real world clinics and real world life. And so we, we worked with the South African Department of Health, who said, go to our worst functioning province, please, go to the Eastern Cape. We went to the Eastern Cape. We went to every single clinic in a health district. It's about 72 clinics. We went into their file rooms. Have you all guys know those big rooms filled with cardboard files? We went through every file. We found every file of every person who had ever started ART and was now a teenager. And then we went and found them at home. Then we got 91% we got of those eligible um, adolescents. A year later, we followed them up and got 97% of them again, and we've just followed them up with a total 94% retention rate. Unfortunately, we've got quite a high mortality rate as well. The second study is really one that's, that's just starting now. We're in the middle of data collection. And this is because we noticed that so many of our teens were having children and struggling. And this study is called Hey Baby. It stands for Helping Empower Youth Brought Up in Adversity with Their Babies and Young Children. Um, and this is going to have, we hope, 700 teenage moms, about half of whom are HIV positive, and their, and their children. Um, and I'm really happy to answer methods questions, but I'm not going to talk much about methods. I'm going to talk about results. So what are we finding? In terms of adherence, and this is based on self-reported past week adherence, we're seeing alarmingly low rates. Um, in the first year, 64% report full adherence in the last week. In the second year, that's gone down to 42%. And if we look at c continuity of adherence, because of course we, adherence should not be seen as a snapshot, we're seeing less than 30% of our teens are adhering over a two-year period. We checked that against viral failure and symptomatic TB, and it seems that they're, they're highly correlated. I mean, one, one of the things that we are discovering, though, is that how, how you ask teens about adherence and who you are when you ask teens about adherence matters. And I reflected on this recently when I went to the dentist. And every time I go to the dentist, the dentist says, do you floss? <laughs> 
And I say, oh, sometimes I try, but this week's been tricky. What I mean is, no, I never floss. I don't have bloody time to floss. I've got a two-year-old and a full-time job. And it made me reflect that if, that if I find it so hard to tell a dental hygienist that I don't floss, how difficult it must be when we ask our teenagers and our children and their mothers about adherence, when we're wearing our white coats and typing things into our, into our checklist, how hard it must be for them to be honest about that. And so if you want to talk, one of the things that I think we really need to think about as provi when we're providing care is asking about adherence in a way that makes it okay to say no. Because otherwise, we'll just get lied to. So we're working on that. I don't know, I don't know how successful it is. It's certainly correlating. Um, it's certainly associating with, with things like viral failure. But, but really happy to talk if we've got more questions about that. This is work of, um, of Roxana's, not mine, but it's um, very clearly looking at um, the treatment cascade that we're seeing in the Eastern Cape. And this is totally not unique to South Africa or to the Eastern Cape. But essentially what we're seeing um, at, the, at the end of a, of a cascade of who's got a viral load and, um, and who's, who's suppressed within that, around 50% viral suppression amongst our positive 10 to 19 year olds. Um, new data that's just come out this week from the Human Sciences Research Council looking at the same question in a national cohort is finding almost identical rates. So I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Teenagers find it really hard to take their meds. So why is that happening? Well, this is just some of the initial data that we're looking at. This is cross-sectional, and we've just finished cleaning the second year. So we're working on trying to understand um, prospectively what predicts non-adherence. But we're finding factors that are not necessarily the things that we're thinking about when someone presents in the clinic. And they're not, that. There's some ways they're no-brainers. We're finding food insecurity. We're finding not enough money to get to the clinic. And we're finding violence coming up over and over again um, as a key predictor. Interestingly, not violence in the community. That doesn't seem to make a difference. But it seems to be violence from those that, that teenagers most trust. It's violence from parents, violence in the household, violence from teachers, and particularly being shouted at in the clinic. We've also looked at a, a range of other um, predictors of of non-adherence. And what we see is that these are spanning, um, you know, if we think about it, spanning the sustainable development goals. We see factors that are internal, and there's, there's some really interesting, um, really interesting posters up sort of over there towards the reception, where we look at things like mental health, and, and we're absolutely seeing this too. We're seeing things going on at home. We're certainly seeing factors within the clinic, but we're also seeing factors about your social life. Think back to when you were 15. What really mattered to you? Was it what was going on when you went to see the doctor? Or was it what your friends thought? What you did after school? Finding things like going to circumcision camp and finding it very difficult to take ART. Um, having a boyfriend or girlfriend, being part of a gang. These are the realities of life for our teenagers. And yet, in, the, in a clinical perspective, we're often not considering how they might, en how they might engage with ART taking. We're also seeing cumulative effects, and this is just one example, looking at impacts of different kinds of violence on, on, um, on non-adherence. And, and really what we're seeing here is that the more types of violence a teenager is exposed to, the higher their rates of non-adherence are going, from around 25% with no violence exposure to over 70% with four types. It's, it's, clear and, and, um, it's clear that vulnerability is a major driver here. Um, and and I, was, I was really interested to see Sarah's um, work, and this is a poster which is up at, at this conference, um, which really reflects many of these quantitative findings in the qualitative research that she's been doing. And I'd really encourage that you go and see that before the end. So then the question is, what can help? And I think this is where, again, as practitioners, the structures in which we work may be failing our teenagers. 
And what I see, I, I, I'm a social worker by training, and I, and I go and I work, and what I see is this. I see that we have a, we have a clinic, and then we have, say, a, um, an OVC program, and we have an NGO that runs its programs um, on something else, and then we have a social services department. And we all think quite differently about what is important for our teenagers. And sometimes, actually, we think in rivalrous terms. You know, those doctors, all they think about is this. Um, these people don't understand why it's so important to get the treatment right. What we're finding in our data is that actually, if we're going to improve adherence outcomes and retention outcomes for our teens, we're going to need to provide specific and clear combinations of services that go across the clinic, social policy and provision, and care. And so this is an example here. We look at probability of past week non-adherence, and, and these are all controlling for like a whole bunch of things and, um, and done in marginal effects with logistic regressions. I'm happy to talk about all this stuff if you, if you want. But what we see is the rates of non-adherence. For an, for an adolescent who has none of access to an HIV support group, doesn't have enough to eat, and doesn't have good parental monitoring, we see around 55% past week non-adherence. If you get any one of those, brings you down to about 40%. Any two brings you down to about 30%. But that combination of those three things can bring non-adherence down to under 20% for teenagers. That's really going to require us doing things a bit differently in our programming, though. We also see, and this is some work we did with the South African Department of Health, who specifically said, what in the clinic can we do to improve retention and care for our teenagers? And we, and we tried to understand what clinic-specific factors. And, and in the end, we came out with some factors that just weren't quite within the clinic. Um, but we came out with five things that really seemed to make a difference. And amazingly, this is Lorraine Scher's idea, they've come up with the acronym STACK. So we find that having a clinic that's sufficiently stocked with medication, having staff who have time to spend with their teenagers. Strangely, it didn't matter how knowledgeable the staff were, which surprised us, um, or whether they had information, that didn't matter. It was the time that mattered. That somebody accompanied them to the clinic, either a family member or a peer advocate or a peer supporter. That they had enough money to get to the clinic and that staff were kind to them when they got there. Kind was a low bar, it was not being shouted at. What we see is that the combination of those five stack factors can bring retention in care, past year retention in care, from 3% to 70%. It's quite clear that some quite simple things can be done to improve adherence and retention. That was actually using the definition of retention in care with Shafiq's definition. Um, it's it's uh, maintaining your appointments and taking your ART. Um, Ilona Tosca's also been doing a lot of work looking at what might be able to reduce risky sex for, um, for our positive teens. And this is just looking at positive girls and the rates of unprotected sex at the last time they had sex. So it's not over the past year. And we see, again, parental monitoring is really crucial here. Per we, we're increasingly finding, unfortunately, that, that positive parenting, so being nice to your teenager, doesn't seem to make very much difference. What matters is questions, monitoring um, in the parenting world is things like, does, uh, do your parents know where you are when you go out at night? Do, they, do you have rules about what time you come home? Do they know who your friends are? Does anyone have a teenager here? Does this all sound familiar? Um, this seems to be the most predictive actually. So we see that the combination of parental monitoring, school access, so ability to, to go to school, and, and kind clinic care, again, can reduce rates of unprotected sex for, for our positive girls from around 50% to around 9%. We also see that combinations, just as combinations of vulnerabilities are leading to higher risk, we see that combinations of positive things, and here we've put them and matched them with SDGs, can also um, reduce risk. So we see um, more access to more kind of positive SDGs, and we're actually seeing lower rates of viral failure or symptomatic untreated pulmonary TB. We're not able to pick up um, non-pulmonary TB because the uh, patient files are, are pretty limited in what they have in them. This is Lorraine Scher's work done in South Africa, Malawi, and Zambia. 
and they find that contact and, um, and receipt of services from community-based organisations, this is for slightly younger, it's for 7 to 13 year olds, are resulting in a set of, of, of more positive outcomes for affected children. And we see that many of those outcomes are the ones that lead directly into, we now know lead directly into non-adherence. So this is, I think, really exciting um, finding and probably the first really good scientific work to look at, um, to look at CBO attendance. This is a study published by Tonya Thurman um, uh, just last year and looking at their bereavement support group. It's a randomized control trial. Um, and showed again that we're seeing that these kinds of support programs can reduce rates of the risk factors that are leading directly to non-adherence. And I think what's exciting is that in the last couple of years, we're starting to see these very good cohort studies and randomized control trials. You know, a couple of years ago, we really didn't have much evidence to go on on what could be, what could be helpful. This is work done by, um, by, by PATA, Pediatric Adolescent Treatment for Africa, looking at the impacts of having a peer supporter in the clinic. And they, for, they look across um, umpteen countries and lots of health facilities and find that, that having a peer supporter leads to much higher rates of viral suppression. Um, new evidence as well that's just been coming out. We see two studies. It's interesting that the work on adolescent-friendly clinics, we're, it's a bit mixed. We're seeing um, that the, uh, some case control studies and cohort studies are, are showing success, but some randomized control trials aren't. And I think what's quite difficult is that we don't have a clear definition. So everyone's trying something a bit different. And we certainly need to start thinking more clearly and in a more evidence-based way about what components will make an adolescent-friendly clinic. It may also just be that the clinic isn't enough and that something else needs to be added to make it more effective. This is um, work done by Ketan Pilo in South Africa, um, looking at um, community support workers and a program that they've developed there. And what they see is um, um, really exciting results on, on reduced mortality and, um, and reduced viral load. And interestingly, they're the only ones I've seen who've done a cost effectiveness analysis, a, a really crucial thing um, when you're going and directly speaking to ministries of health um, and, and funders about this. And I, I think that's one of the things we often don't think about because the economists do that. Um, one thing I've learned is that the economists um, think will convey that cost-effectiveness studies are a bit harder than they really are. If anyone's got a good master's student, I would recommend doing them. We're also seeing really exciting work. This came out just um, a few months ago. Um, this is work done by um, Fred Suswamala and Claude Mellons is um, involved in this. This is looking at the development in Uganda of child development accounts. They're a sort of savings program for um, teenagers and their families, positive teens and their families, including a kind of family financial literacy um, program and, and um, adherence counselling. And what they're seeing is direct and positive impacts in a large randomised control trial on improved rates of adherence and reduced viral load. So we're starting to see just recently this exciting new evidence base for this. But there's also a group that seem to be falling absolutely through these cracks. And I've heard this, this group being brought up over and over again in this meeting, and often in tiny numbers, but a, a, a group of great concern. And that's our HIV-positive mums, whether vertically or horizontally infected, who are becoming mothers themselves. We know almost nothing about, about the fathers. We're just starting to look at the very first findings. This is because we couldn't wait, and Ilona and I had a quick sneak look. But what we're seeing is high rates of, of pregnancy, 10% incident pregnancy per year, multiple pregnancies, which we're often not thinking about with teenagers, and we're seeing high rates, about double the, the national average rates of having a positive child. Perhaps even more worryingly, nearly 50% of our positive teen moms stopped ART for at least a couple of weeks whilst they were pregnant. We're seeing 23% mixed feeding their child and astonishingly, this is self-report, 
68% of them were non-adherent to the ART in the last three days. This is a group that is absolutely glaring that we need to do something for. We're also seeing that they're experiencing a range of um, real sexual risks. And some of those risks seem to be driven by teenage motherhood. So for example, um, transactional sex you know, goes up. If you see that on the far left, there's, there's control who are neither positive nor mothers. And then this is just girls. Then we've got just positive, then just moms, and then positive moms. And you'll see that, that transactional sex is, is um, driven by being, um, by being a mom. You also see that grade failure, failing your last grade at school, is driven by being a mom. But there are other outcomes where there's a, a strong interactive effect. And we see this, for example, with having an age disparate partner, partner who's more than uh, five years older than you in the last year, sexual partner. And there we see a, a more than four times increased rate, a, an exponential increase from being positive and a mom. We also see that for school dropout. And it really makes us start thinking that we're going to have to start, and I, I heard earlier today talking about, are we treating adolescent moms as moms or as adolescents? And it may be that both of those are wrong because they're living in a situation, in a life context that might be quite different to either of those sets of assumptions that come with, that they're not the 40-year-old married woman and nor are they the teenager necessarily at school and accessible through that. And, and I don't think we know enough yet about how to reach them properly, but we certainly need to. There is some exciting and compelling evidence over the last five years on, on introduction of, um, of early childhood development work and support for mothers into HIV care and... Um, and um, Landon Meyer is, is the author of the one that just, I think, probably most compellingly has just published on this. But essentially, they all show that if you do a really good program, um, it can improve outcomes, HIV clinical outcomes for both mother and child. What we don't know yet is whether these work with teenage moms and how that's going to, how we can improve and support that. So I'm just going to end with a, with a concept um, that, that I haven't heard about much today which is thinking about the sustainable development goals and how we as an HIV community might be able to capitalize on these. Generally in the HIV community, I've heard sustainable development goals seen as a threat. We, we've lost our MDG, that's all of our own. Funding is being reduced, things are be becoming wider. But actually there may be extraordinary opportunities that we can use even in a shrinking HIV budget, to benefit our positive adolescents and children. This is a concept that was developed by the UN Development Programme, and um, it's called the Accelerator Concept. And it's in response to the fact that um, governments in particular are feeling overwhelmed by these 17 goals and 169 targets, and how are we going to manage to deal with all of this at the same time? <laughs> And what they said is, well, how about there's programs that can have impacts at the same time? One program can have impacts across multiple SDG goals. It's a brilliant idea. They don't actually have much data to produce this. The two they talk about are cash transfers and tobacco control, because we, they have impacts across health and across employment and across you know, kind of good outcomes across goals. So we've tested this concept in our 1,000... HIV positive teens. And essentially we looked at a range of services that they are receiving. This is not a randomized trial, this is a um, prospective longitudinal study. And we've said, uh, and we looked at the services that they were receiving in large enough numbers. So for example, unfortunately only 5% of them were getting a support group, so it, we weren't really able to look at it. But we were able to look at things like cash transfers and, um, and uh, good parenting provisions that they might receive. And so this is just an example of one combination. We see that going, going to a school that is safe, that means not being beaten by teachers and not being beaten by other pupils, has positive impacts across 10 SDG targets, which travel across four SDG goals. 
We see that good parental monitoring, which has been shown, we've seen ways to do this in things like the Sinovio Teen Programme, the Safe Schools has been demonstrated in the Good Schools Study in Uganda. That has, um, so the good parenting has impacts across eight SDG targets and, and, um, and four SDG goals again. And, and happy to talk about how we did this, it's marginal effects models. But perhaps more excitingly is we think and we ask the question, what can happen if we can provide both of those things together? Do we get a maximized impact? And the answer is yes. If we can combine those two programs together, we can see substantial increases in impact across 11 SDG targets and four SDG goals. But what matters for us, perhaps most of all, is the two top green ones on the right-hand side. We see improved rates of retention in care and improved rates of ART adherence. Now, we may end up with no money to provide programs, specific community-based programs for our positive teams. But if we can make sure that the programs that are being provided more generally for vulnerable adolescents are tapping the things that we need, that our positive teams need in order to adhere and retain in care, then that's how we can capitalize on the new development agenda that is the SDGs. It's gonna mean we need to be ahead of the game and thinking well beyond the clinic. So have we solved the puzzle of adherence? Far from it. But I think that the evidence base is exciting the new randomized trials and cohort studies that are coming out are giving us more and more to work on. Um, and I would say, let's start talking about this and let's start building the strongest evidence base we can to reduce the major challenge that all of our work is facing. Thank you. <laughs>